Hello, everyone. I'm John Paz, and I changed the title of my talk today. Um, so the original title of this talk was Five Ways to Build an Inclusive Team Immediately and Why You Should. Um, I don't know why I chose the number five. It just seemed arbitrary. I put, picked it out of the air, and it's a mouthful. Um, so I changed the title to be a little bit more catchy um, and to make sure it conveys the essence of what I want to talk about today. So quick little housekeeping. Um, first, I'll go briefly into my origin story, how I got here. Um, then I'll dig into the nuances of diversity and inclusion terminology. Then I'll describe the importance of uh, creating a sense of belonging is to every team. And then I'll end with some takeaways about how everyone can help build a sense of belonging in any team that you're on. So let's get started. First up, my origin story. Now, you can't really know me until you know my parents. Now, these two beautiful people are my father, Augustine Paz, and my mother, Dr. Lynn Kazmir Paz. Now, my dad is Cuban and could probably pass as white, and my mom is black from Louisiana. So, that makes me Puerto Rican. <laughs> No, but seriously, there's always truth in jest. I'm not actually Puerto Rican, but I could pass for someone who comes from the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico. Um, but let's move on. So I was lucky enough to date this beautiful lady all throughout high school. This is my wife, Daisha, who is actually Puerto Rican. <laughs> this year, we'll be celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary. Thank you. I actually, at one point, built into my slides, hold for applause, but that felt presumptuous. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I earned my undergraduate degree um, in English with a focus in technical writing from the University of Central Florida out of Orlando, Florida. And of my 13 years of experience in technology, only about half of that is working with companies like Atlassian, that were the so-called high-tech companies, the software companies. And in 2015, Atlassian made me an offer to move me from sunny Orlando, Florida to sunnier Sydney, Australia. And last year, I moved back to the States to work on the Bitbucket Cloud team out of San Francisco. Oh, but there's one more thing you should probably know about me. And that's my wife and I have three beautiful young kids. And the first of which we had when we were 19 and fresh out of high school. And see, where does that fall in the timeline? Well, right about there, at the very, very beginning. So everything I've just described to you, everything I've accomplished and everything I've worked through, my wife and I did while raising three rambunctious but wonderful children. Oh, so let's, let's update this slide a little bit, shall we? Ah, that's better. So from left to right, my daughter Antonia, who's 14, my son Armando, who's 12, and Amaya on the right is 16. She's studying to get her driver's license soon, so y'all pray for me. <laughs> so why is knowing my story important? Well, this presentation is a collection of anecdotes and experiences with research and advice mixed in from experts. Now, my journey is full of experiences that most people in tech probably couldn't relate to. I'm black and I'm Cuban. I didn't start my career in tech. I didn't go to an Ivy League or Bay Area school. And I had kids very early in life. Sometimes these things leave me feeling a little bit vulnerable at work. Sometimes I feel isolated, like there's not many people that can relate to me or my experiences. And because the theme of this conference is all about building trust, um, the, advice he, the advice here comes from the moments I felt a sense of belonging at work. Most of, this, most of the situations I will describe here are from time, my time here at Atlassian. Feeling that I belong has positively impacted how I do my job every day. It gives me more confidence in shipping my work, and it makes me feel that my contribution is valued. By the end of this presentation, we'll all have learned how we can help create a sense of belonging in every team. First up, I am a technical writer by trade, so I did want to talk about the nuances of some of the terminology around diversity and inclusion. To set the baseline, let's get one thing clear. Diversity is important. I don't think anybody here needs to debate that. But even when you ignore the moral argument about diversity, demographic projections make a compelling practical argument for the importance of having a diverse team. Our target, our target audience is changing, so shouldn't our workforce reflect that change? Cultural knowledge plays an essential role in building products with broad appeal. 
So it makes sense that an engaged, diverse employee base would be more competitive in a globalized workspace. We all know Atlassian's mission statement by now. It's an admirable one. But we no longer build software for teams that build software. So diversity is expected if we truly hope to unleash the potential of every team. But having diverse teams only gives underrepresented people a seat at the table. And diversity alone doesn't get you much. It's not enough for folks to just have a seat at the table. Their voices need to be included regarding how things are done. And diversity and inclusion is shown to give teams a competitive advantage in lots of ways. Diversity is shown to drive revenue growth and improve employee happiness and retention. In fact, there's evidence to suggest that when solving problems, diversity may actually be more important than, an indivi than individual ability. Today's high-performing teams regularly include people with diverse perspectives and experiences. So we need to plan for that. Now, there's actually a correlation between diversity and innovation and creative output. The creative output of teams improves when diverse vo voices are included in the conversation. That's because diverse teams are more likely to use a broad range of innovative techniques and bring a bunch of different perspectives <laughs> to the table, which again, makes it much more relevant making decisions to compete in a globalized economy. And on the flip side, homogeneous teams lack diverse, that lack diversity are much more likely to, sh to share assumptions, perspectives, and not be able to identify their own gaps in knowledge. You do so at your own peril to have a team that's not diverse. I'll, I can even give you an example that everyone here can probably relate to. That new person who just started on their first day, they come to you after only sitting at their desk for about 30 minutes after having their computer set up, and they found a bug. It's not just dumb luck. It's an outsider's perspective that found things that are often overlooked. Diversity and inclusion can give you those same kind of benefits. But even inclusivity, once all the range in DNI conversations, it's the I in DNI, has been deemed just a starting point. <coughs> For people to bring their unique viewpoints and know that they're valued, we need to work to build balance within our teams. This goes past the notion of just having diversity for the sake of diversity. It makes it so that no one's left out, even people who might not identify or be minorities. Because sometimes the emphasis on diversity can make it feel like other people are being excluded. So the new emphasis is on building balance, where everyone feels they have a stake in the game and is motivated to stay engaged. But if you still need more convincing, you should know that there's also a correlation between management, management's diversity and a company's overall financial performance. And this correlation has actually has a greater impact on tech companies like Atlassian. One study even claims that for every 1% increase in minority representation, tech companies could experience a 3% increase in overall revenue. This stuff matters. Having a balance of different voices in the room matters. Diversity, inclusion, and even balance can all be measured with data. It's actually not so difficult to define these things. But for this talk, I wanted to dive just a little bit deeper than that, to the fundamental need that all us humans have. And that's a sense of belonging. <clears throat> So the importance of belonging is personal to me, but I think it's got benefits to everyone sitting here in this room. And for the purposes of this conference, feeling like you belong is the stepping stone for building trust amongst each other. <coughs> now raise your hand, have you ever heard Mike and Scott say this before? I should see every hand in this room up in the air right now. Either you're not paying attention or you're really new, that's okay. I don't know about you, but this was a game changer for me. I'd never heard an executive t ever say something like this. But in order to fulfill this notion, people must feel they can bring their authentic selves to work every single day. Now this is Aubrey. She's our global head of DNI. And when I gave a version of this talk at Summit, she left a lot of red ink all over my presentation about overusing the words diversity and inclusion. Because again, like I just explained to you, these terms carry much more nuance than just diversity and inclusion can usually describe. 
actually, Aubrey used to be the global head of diversity and inclusion. Now she's the global head of diversity and belonging. She felt it was so important that she insisted that she change her title to include the word belonging. So Aubrey explained to me that having teams with, with diverse perspectives is always a good idea. But just being diverse doesn't mean that your team will automatically reap the, all the benefits that I just described that diversity can give you. And that's because the team should feel that they belong. Just as important as representation is that sense of belonging in the team. Being a representative is only useful if you feel like your voice is actually heard because otherwise you're not really representing anything. It's just tokenism. How can we expect to do the best work of our lives without buying in to our teams and what we're doing? So belonging matters. And a sense of belonging was correlated with retention at Atlassian. You can read all about it in Aubrey's 2018 Diversity and Belonging Report, which is a fantastic read if you haven't done so already. And this makes sense, right? Because you don't want to leave a place where you feel like you belong. When you feel like you matter to other people, you're much more likely to stay and to want to stick around. Now, just because belonging is difficult to measure doesn't mean it's so difficult to define. So to me, belonging starts with acceptance. It's important that we have a shared understanding of what all this means so that we can have these conversations in our teams every day. And the feeling, of, the feeling of acceptance is not the same thing as tolerance. It's knowing that I'm here for a reason. Now, a balanced and diverse team isn't one that pretends that we're all the same either. A sense of belonging acknowledges our differences while still seeking out how we're the same. This means seeking first to understand, but then seeking second to be understood. Belonging also means feeling appreciated and that your work is valued. We all have something meaningful to contribute. So the best way to show that you value someone's contribution of their work is to give them meaningful work to do. Don't just throw tasks that aren't important. Don't give them the work that you might give to someone with lesser skills. Give them work that matters. Hold them accountable and keep your expectations high. You'll be surprised what people can show you. Great. This is all well and fine, John, but how do we actually do these things? How do we create a sense of belonging in any team? Because this is something that's important, not just for your teams at work, but for any team that you belong in outside of work. But it's not a trivial thing to do either. So here we go with some tips about how to build a greater sense of belonging in any team that you're on. The first thing, and I think Atlassian is very good at this already, is building team rituals. Start building these, start building a sense of belonging with meaningful and thoughtful team rituals. You need, no look, you, you need look no further than our being here today at Design Week to see an example of a great team ritual. But how can you do something similar with your smaller team? Now, a great example of a team ritual that fosters more belonging for me is team demos. And I think that the Stash team that I started on actually did these a little bit differently and better in my mind than a lot of teams that I've been on before. Because weekly demos for the Stash team were rowdy, fun affairs. Yes, we had lots of developers showing us terminal scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And that I'm supposed to be impressed. I don't understand what's happening sometimes, but that's OK. It gives them their opportunity to show me what they've been working on. And I ask them questions. And I can appreciate what they've done. And just the same, reciprocally, they asked me to show my work, which as a writer has never happened before. They wanted to see what I was working on. They wanted to know what I thought. And when there was nothing to demo, we just had beers at 4 o'clock. This made me feel like I was part of the team, and it was consistent throughout my entire time there. Now, another ritual that may not be necessarily work-related um, is the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. It goes by lots of different names. In Australia, you switch the words around a little bit, and I don't think that's right, but that's fine. <laughs> but Rock, Paper, Scissors actually saved my marriage, believe it or not. I told you I had three kids, and at one point, all three of those kids were in diapers. Three children's in diapers. Yeah, this guy gets it right here. Yeah, it's, it's, nobody wants to do that. So at a certain point, we couldn't remember who changed the last diaper. And of course, being the feminist that I am, I want to share the burden with my wife, and she wants to share the burden with me. So we want to make sure it's fair. But when it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you just got done feeding them a bottle, 
and then they pooped after you fed them for an hour, knowing who changed the last diaper becomes life and death between you and your sleepy wife. So the, so the solution was rock, paper, scissors. And no matter who lost, the loser always changes the poopy diaper, bar none. Best out of three, of course. So that's a good example of how team rituals can do things like solve conflicts. When you plan on what's going to happen when a problem arises, and then you ritualize it, there's no longer a question about how, what to do when it happens. It's just that this is what we're going to do now that this has happened. Oh, and one of my favorite team rituals, which I haven't seen in a little while, was formal Fridays. Now, some of the people in this room, I think, helped start formal Fridays back in the day, but it soon became a really fun thing to do in Atlassian, so much so that other teams outside of the Sydney offices started to do it as well. And at one point, we even had an entire all hands where everybody was meant to be dressed in formal attire. For a tech company, that's a bizarre photo. <laughs> wow, we had a really good time that day. That's when we used to go, have to go to the Angel, Play, Angel Palace or whatever it's called, right across the street. But this is not my proudest moment because nobody told me we we're gonna be taking selfies today for Formal Friday, and I'd left my phone in the office. If you look, I'm all the way back in the corner there. Let's see. And that's me holding a water bottle. <laughs> yeah. Can't say I look like I belong there, do I? No, but I digress. So team rituals can help create a sense of belonging by building trust between one another, because you know what to expect you know when you'll be able to see them next, and you know how to share. And it also creates a safe place for everyone to share their experiences, and people should be encouraged to do so. And the best team rituals get everyone involved, because we all should feel that we've got a stake in how things are done amongst our teams. So even though you have these rituals, invite the new person to change them or to add something to them. Ask them what they think about it. How did it make them feel? It's incredibly important that everyone feels like they've got some way to change things if they don't like the way they are. And thoughtful team rituals can even help resolve conflicts when done right. So with a, lot, with a bit of planning and some foresight, you can use team rituals creatively to give the team ways to solve problems productively. Another suggestion for creating a greater sense of belonging might not be something that you would expect, and that's great onboarding. Now the standard 90-day plan is fine. All right, it's a checklist, but it's fine. It's a great start on an okay onboarding experience, but it doesn't help share a team's understanding always. Just setting up your environment, downloading some tools, installing some licenses, doesn't really tell you anything about the historical choices that teams make, how a product came to be in the first place. This is where, I, again, I felt like the Stash team did a really great job with me on my onboarding. After I got everything set up, at the end of the first week, I got to sit down with one of the lead engineers, someone who was there from the very beginning, and they told me all about how Stash was born, what it was for, why we chose the name Stash, which as an American I thought was a little dodgy, <laughs> but it was great. So when we had to rebrand later to Bitbucket Server, I had this attachment with this thing, much like the rest of my teammates, even though it was only six months into my tenure. I was like one of them. I felt like I had a stake in the name Stash. And one of my favorite things when I first moved to Sydney was the expats program. And I want to give a quick shout out to my buddy Tony Starr over there, who was my expat buddy when I first moved to Sydney. Let's give Tony Starr a round of applause. <laughs> you're, you're my boy, Tony, you're my boy. But the expats buddy program gave me a friendly face to look for when I arrived in Sydney. And it created this sense of belonging when I got here, because I already had a friend. Not just any friend, but a really funny friend who understood where I was coming from. And of course, the ultimate onboarding experience is Hack House. It's actually onboarding on steroids. There's really no better example of a great, well-planned, thoughtful onboarding experience. And it's Atlassian's. It's something that I think our competitors are very jealous of. It gives our new employees the freshest of us, 30 days together to just work on problems and to learn the Atlassian way of doing things. I can't think of a better experience on how to learn to be an Atlassian. And it's pretty clear if you see, if you read our marketing materials about this, I won't read this stuff out loud, 
But it's this deliberate intent to create this sense of belonging amongst the new hires that seeps through in everything that you see around Hack House. You can tell that we want these new grads to trust us. They say, give me some of your precious time and we'll give you back a great experience working for Atlassian and money, of course. So a great onboarding experience is go above and beyond the typical 90-day tasks. Think about what do people need to know to be a functioning member of this team? And try to go past the nuts and bolts of everyday minutia. And great onboarding experiences are consistent for every teammate that joins the team, regardless of their role. That's the same for devs, designers, writers, PMs, and anyone in between. This helps to create a shared understanding so that we can all function together better. We understand how we work together, and it makes it so that we all have the same level of knowledge whenever we start approaching a hairy problem. And you do well to make all your onboarding experiences memorable. If you can't think of at least one thing that you accomplished during your onboarding here at Atlassian, it might be time to go revisit that onboarding. Ask one of your new team members if they remember one task that they completed from their onboarding. Try to make at least one thing memorable, even if it's just a goofy celebration at the end that they finished their 90-day program. I know that lots of us are probably guilty of not actually checking that last box on the 90-day page because our lives moved on and work started. But make it memorable. Now, the last big tip to help your team build a sense of belonging is something that I'm sure everyone in this audience can appreciate, and that's skill empathy. Empathy for the things that we can accomplish. Now, building skill empathy will look different for each team, but I can point to some examples from my time here at Atlassian that helped me and my understanding of the wonderful things that my colleagues were capable of. I recently went through an exercise with, with my team where we each went around and listed one another's superpowers and kryptonites, basically our strengths and weaknesses. We affectionately referred to them, our, and our experience, that experience left me with a great sense of how my te teammates value my input. It was flattering, but it was also extremely useful. And it also provided me an opportunity to gush about them as well, to tell them what I think they do right, and where I think that we can work together better, or what I admire about them. It was a refreshing experience, and I think we're all just a little bit closer because of it. Now, the teams in Austin, I think, where it started, used to do these things called weird talks. I'm not sure if they still do them. But a weird talk is where any Atlassian can get up on stage and talk about something they're absolutely mad about. This caught on in Sydney as well. And attending a weird talk was anything but weird. At these talks, I learned all kinds of things about my colleagues' skills and talents that I had no idea about. And it also gave me a bit of personal trivia so that I can relate to them better in passing. And the weird talks really inspired me to probe a little bit more thoroughly into the prior lives and hobbies of my colleagues. I started thinking, what other secret superpowers are my colleagues hiding behind their desks? Because regardless of how we all ended up here at Atlassian, we're all individuals with a range of talents and skills which can help us work together better. And a lot of those have nothing to do with what we do for money. Some great examples, and I don't think I told everyone that their face was gonna be up on the screen. Each of these at Lasting has a superpower that may only be semi-related to their actual role. And uncovering these things gave me a greater connection with them, and in turn with Atlassian. It also provides me benefits in influencing how I work with them on a regular basis. So you should leave your assumptions at the door and figure out what makes your peers tick. You might just find out that your, resi your resident designer is, is a moonlighting novelist, or that your writing colleague is actually a badass sketch artist. So a diverse team has a variety of unique skills, even amongst peers of the same role. Taking the time to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses will help dividing up responsibilities and enable you all to, to better support one another. And when you understand and appreciate what your colleagues can do, it helps so that you can advocate on their behalf with confidence. And this isn't just something to do during the superpowers exercise either. The most important time to advocate for your teammates is when they're not even in the room. Finally, dig deeper into the prior lives and hobbies of your teammates. When we learn about one another, we also learn how to better relate to each other, and that in turn enables us to trust each other more. 
Now, I know I went over a lot of stuff right now, so I'll do a really quick recap. Everything is really quick when people are on stage, but it's never quick when you're sitting there listening to me. So first, diversity and inclusion matters. That's not up for debate. It's non-negotiable. And as I explained, how a diverse workforce is actually a competitive advantage, especially for tech companies like Atlassian. But diversity and inclusiveness are not enough. Instead, Aubrey has shown us that we should all be aiming for building teams with a sense of balance and belonging, which isn't to say that the DNI stuff doesn't matter. The D and the I come before everything else. And then I dove into what belonging actually means and why it's particularly important that your contribution is valued within an Atlassian. And the first of the three tips I gave was how we can all help build a sense of belonging through our own teams using rituals. Meaningful, thoughtful, well-planned rituals can help build authenticity and shared experiences that we can rely on to inform our work down the line. The second tip I gave was to get serious about beefing up your team's onboarding experience. A thoughtful onboarding experience creates a lasting legacy the new team members can use to get familiar with what's important to your team. And lastly, really getting to know your teammates so you can appreciate their journey and their skills. Empathizing with each of our unique individual skills gives us the confidence to advocate for one another and be able to be each other's greatest champions. It's up to all of you to help create a sense of belonging. Thank you very much. All right. We can, sure, we can do questions. <clears throat> no mic, no questions. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I can stay around for a little while. I got nowhere to be. Um, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, I have a question, though. For teams that are distributed, mm. what advice do you have for building rituals, or do you have any examples of good ones you could share? Oh, there were some really good ones. Um, recently, the Bitbucket Cloud team has been trying to do sparring, I think it's sparring, yeah, sparring exclusively remotely, which means that even if we're all sitting at our desks, we break out into phone booths and kind of simulate that we're all remote. And what that helps do is give us um, a bit more empathy for our teammates who aren't in the same location for us. And then it also makes it so that we've got easier expectations. So I think it's very similar to being consistent and finding something that everyone doesn't hate. Not everyone loves doing the remote meetings, especially when we're all sitting right next to each other. But it does help us give empathy for Keith, who unfortunately has to dial in almost after hours because of the time change. So just find what you, find what you all can tolerate uh, and try to make it consistent and always change. No pressure, mate. Hello. Please tell us about Courtney's baby shower. Oh. That was a great example Story of time. distributed Yeah, so um, one of our design managers, Courtney, was pregnant. Uh, I think in her last week, we did a distributed or um, a remote baby shower. Billy was there. We played some games. We played uh, Price is Right and Jeopardy in Mural. Uh, <laughs> everybody got together. We, we did a Trello board for her, wishing her well. Um, yeah, it was great. That's fantastic. Where, where's the write-up on that, Billy? I need, I need, I need more I can work on that. that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yep. More questions, and please say your name on the camera. We, we've got one question over there. Looks like a disgruntled writer. I'm Clara, I'm doing Vanguard end-to-end -end content design these days. And uh, you told us about your past lives, what's your weirdest hobby? Ooh. I'm, to me it's weird because I'm obsessed with it, but most people think it's kind of boring, especially techies, but I'm, I'm a soccer junkie. So I've been to three World Cups, I coach my kids' teams, and I play on the weekends as well. And if I had even more time, I'd probably be a referee. So I don't just like soccer, I love it, I breathe it. Um, a lot of people think Sports is kind of boring, but it's what me and my kids do together. It's how we spend time together. So it's, it's my favorite thing to do, but I take it to another. Even my kids are like, Dad, you're still watching soccer. Could you, do you care about these teams? I'm like, no, I don't even know who's playing. I just wanted to, I just, wanted to, I just like having it in the background while I fold laundry. So. 
Not, not, a, not the super weirdest thing, but it's my thing. That was awesome, John. Cheers. Um, I'm Keith. I work on Bitbucket Cloud with John. Uh, I just had a question about, so we talked a lot about teams and you know, how we can set up this sort of uh, framework for belonging. Do you have any tips for somebody who might be joining a new team, like the mm. individual that's like coming into the situation, something that they could do to kind of help that along? Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of times in Atlassian, I've seen people want to give training wheels to the new person. Saying, oh, you don't, don't worry, you got time, you just started, it's your first week, we don't, no, bullshit. I say, give them work that matters, expect them to turn something in, or if, they, if you're not given that as a new employee, say, I wanna turn something, I wanna feel like I accomplished something. A good 90 day program will help you with that, absolutely. But if it doesn't prescribe something, um, then, oh, ask to improve the internal documentation. We have a read of it. I, I tech writer answer, I understand, but it's important because every team should have some way that they document how they do things. If they don't, that might be where the new person can actually provide some value. And if it does exist, you can read it and learn things. If it doesn't exist, you can help contribute. So a doc answer from a doc guy. <laughs> I should try to see if I can make all my answers be reflective in documentation somehow. <laughs> I'm sure that'd be thrilling. Yes, it'll be thrilling. I'm always on brand. Any other questions? <laughs> 